right. Oh, the microphone has to be on. Revelation chapter 10. <clears throat> and um, we discussed verses 1 through 6 last time. But today I want to discuss verses 5 through 7, but specifically verse 7. 5 and 6 are going to kind of get us into what's being said there, provide for us some context. But I want to speak about just verse 7 today. And the title of this message this morning is The Mystery of God Finished. The Mystery of God Finished. So let's jump in to, to verse 5. It says, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven. <clears throat> And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Now we found out last week a few things. One, that's the Lord Jesus there. That's just another picture of him. Uh, the second thing we found out is there should be time no longer. It does not necessarily mean that Time will stop like it's two o'clock, like that'll stop. That means that there's no more waiting. There's no more time between what uh, for someone to get saved, basically, is what it boils down to, because now it's time. The Lord is calling his home. He's coming back to earth, setting up his kingdom. And buddy, it's too late. Amen. That's what that means. Now let's get to verse seven. Now listen to this very carefully. I, I understand that people believe in a pre-trib rapture. I used to believe that. And where I was taught it was at church and in Bible college. That's where I was taught about a pre-trib rapture. I was very good at it. I could um, pull up a dry erase board and I could draw all the charts, even made up my own charts, and just really, really convince somebody about the rapture. But there's one big problem with it. It wasn't anywhere in the Bible. It's not the only thing I've ever believed that wasn't in the Bible that I learned at church. I used to believe in faith promise missions. That's not in the Bible. Amen. So this is something that we're going to look at Scripture. And this Scripture right here is pivotal for us to understand a little bit of when the calling away of the saints actually is. So let's look at this together in verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. Now what is he talking about there? That seventh trumpet, right? Seven angels have seven trumpets. When he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So I want to look at basically three things here. I've divided it up, that verse, in three different areas for us to understand it better. Number one, it says it's when the seventh angel sounds. So we're going to have to look at that. Number two, that the mystery of God should be finished. And number three, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. I want to understand all of it, don't you? I don't want to just bypass things and just try to get my point of view across. Anyway, let's begin with the thought when the first or when the seventh angel sounds. Sorry about that. First of all, we can see this is prophetic. In this narrative, six angels have sounded, but the seventh hath not sounded yet. It is prophetic. Turn the page and look over at chapter 11 and verse 15. And we see the sounding of it. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Now, of course, we will review these when we go into chapter 11. But for now, it provides for us context and understanding. This is a day of complete change. It means when that trumpet sounds, time as it is, the way things are will be no more. Amen? Uh, in, in verse 6 there, when he said there should be time no longer, it means that all persecutions will cease. All heresies will cease. 
All doubts will cease. All putting your hand to the plow and looking back, that'll cease. Everything will stop and it will be new. It'll all end. Amen. And there'll be an entirely new beginning. In chapter 19 and verse 6, the actual return of Christ, it says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Amen. So when he's talking about in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, he's talking about when that seventh angel sounds his trumpet, everything as we know it will change. That's what time will be no longer means. Amen. Now, two things will happen at once. And I'm going to show you this from the scripture. I'm not going to draw you a chart this morning. Amen. Two things will happen at once, at least concerning the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Number one, certain angels will gather the tares for burning. Now keep your hand in Revelation and let's go back to Matthew 13 where the Lord gives us a parable that, that describes this event to us. Matthew chapter 13 and I want you to look at verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. You can bet he's sowing right now. We're preaching the gospel and he's sowing the seed. Amen. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Now notice... Uh, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and then them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Boy, you can't prove a rapture by that text, can you? But it says that when the Lord returns, He's going to send angels to bind up all of those in His kingdom that offend. Whoa, now you have to be taught here to understand really what that means. I've not seen too many churches that understand that the kingdom and what it is. Amen. But we let us move on. Go over to Revelation 14. Revelation 14. So remember, there's two things that's going to happen at once. Certain angels will gather the tares for burning. But in chapter 14, if you'll look at beginning in verse 14, and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse's bridles, or the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Amen. We see that angels will come and gather the tares for burning. And he does it through um, bringing the armies of the world and the beast to Armageddon. And all this stuff is going on. All these trumpets coming down. These, the majority of people will not repent. We've already read that. They're going to have an ire against God. They're going to claim Him to be an alien or whatever they're going to try to do that TV's teaching them to do. And then they're going to try to get together like it's Independence Day and they're going to try to fight off the aliens. Bad news for you. 
Hey man, your eyeballs are going to be melted in their sockets. Zechariah. Anyway, so that's going to happen. But there's another thing that's going to happen at the same time of the seventh trumpet. And that is the resurrection of the righteous dead. The resurrection of the righteous dead. You know something? When we die, don't you worry. Don't you worry at all. Because as Lazarus heard the voice of Jesus saying, Lazarus, come forth, and a dead man got up and walked out of that crypt, we're going to jump up out of them graves when we hear the, with the shout, the trumpet, and the voice of the archangel. <laughs> Amen. We're going, to jump. we're going to hear that thing. And we're going to jump right up. Now, if we're living, we'll talk about that here in just a second. But anyway, turn with me. Now, well, before we turn, Go back to Revelation 10 and let me read our verse again. I, I want to get this fresh in our mind. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So we see in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. Keep in your hand here. Jump with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And I want you to look at verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Isn't that a word we just read? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, somebody give me that next phrase. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Now you see a couple things there. One, you see the righteous dead being resurrected and, and we understand later that they get glorified bodies. However, the best news is that we which are alive at the return in that seventh trumpet will go with them. That's what it said right there. We'll all be changed. As a matter of fact, I want you to jump over with me to 1 Thessalonians 4. And I want to read verse 13 to you. You know, the Thessalonians were a little discouraged thinking that the return of Christ had come and they missed it. <laughs> Amen. But Paul writes this letter to show them that that's not the case. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13 says... But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, who's that? That's the saved dead. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Are we, are we not hearing the same exact theme that we just got from Revelation 10, 7? Yeah, it's the same thing. So with the trump of God and the voice of the archangel and so on, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. All right, we already got that news. But then he says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Notice that guy that was reaping over there in uh, Revelation 14 was in a cloud. Isn't that interesting? To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, jump over with me to Matthew 24. Remember, when we started our study on Revelation, we had to do a lot of correlation between the uh, seals and Matthew 24 so we can understand what in the world's going on. Hey, Amen? Still on the same theme, two things are going to happen at once when the seventh angel sounds. One, the tares will be gathered for the burning and two, the resurrection of the righteous dead and the calling away of the uh, righteous that are not dead yet. But look at Matthew 24 and beginning in verse 27. 
For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Boy, that doesn't sound like a secret rapture to me. That thing so secret, it's not anywhere in Scripture. Anyway, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. What that means is just like when you find a dead cow, man, you're going to see birds flocking to it. But when the Lord returns, you're going to see Christians flocking to Him. Amen? Anyways, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Doesn't that sound like seals and trumpets, all the things we've already described? He says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Here it is again. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So when does it look like the gathering of God's people is? Looks like it's at that last trump, doesn't it? When's the last trump? What's the seventh trumpet that we're talking about in Revelation? How many last trumps are there? How many times does God have to give us numbers of something before we figure out what's first and what's last? Amen. The seventh trumpet is last. It's the last trumpet. All right, let me give you one more. This will give you even more information. Go over to Luke chapter 21. Y'all don't mind turning a lot and comparing this morning, do you? Amen. I, I really love to uh, convince. I really love to teach the Word of God, and I believe it's not taught. If I just sit up here and give you my opinion and, and throw off some things, I believe we need to see what God has to say and let the Spirit teach us. Amen? Because Brother Sam could be wrong. Right? Could, could I be wrong? Oh yeah, I know I could, because I've been wrong before. <laughs> Amen? I don't like being wrong. Does anybody here like being wrong? I don't like being wrong. So we go to the Scriptures and See, I'm accountable to God to interpret these scriptures, but I'm accountable to you also. Amen. It keeps us on track, doesn't it? Anyway, Luke chapter 21 and look at verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. Well, there it is again. I don't know how people... He said your redemption. He's talking to the living church of God. How in the world people could come up with a pre-trib rapture? Anyway... So, number one, when the seventh angel sounds, we see a lot of things are going to happen. Amen? Number two, he says here that the mystery of God should be finished. The mystery of God should be finished. Now, I want you to know that when he says the mystery of God, I really looked at that word mystery, and I don't believe he's really giving us one particular mystery of God. Uh, because there are so many mysteries that will be answered when he comes back. And I'll show you those. I believe there's many mysteries, and I think when he says the mystery of God should be finished, he means basically what we would call today the mysteriousness of God's plan should be finished. In other words, <laughs> it'll all be clear. There won't be, I wonder what God's doing. No, it's going to be clear. Amen. And so let me just give you some things here that will become clear to us, some mysteries. Number one, in chapter 10 and verse 4, uh, we see, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven others, thunders uttered, and write them not. Well, that's mysterious, isn't it? That's a mystery. We're going to find out all about that. Amen. We're going to know what those seven thunders uttered. Amen. We're going to hear them when it happens. Amen. We're going to know them. Let me give you another a mystery that will be finished, and that is Daniel's sealed book. 
And that was basically with the Jews and the Jewish nation. But in Daniel 12 and verse 4, he says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Amen. In other words, when it's all done, we're going to understand. You know, when the Lord returns, people are going to start scattering like bugs. Many are going to run to and fro. You see all these pre uh, or these dispensationalists, TV evangelists and stuff, they're running to and fro. That means great transportation, airplanes and trains and stuff. One day they might even beam you up. Amen. No, dumb dumb. He's talking about the return of the Lord. He comes back, people are going to go Phew, like cockroaches. Amen. We're going to be running to him. Everybody else can be scattered from him. Amen. And knowledge shall increase. That's the same thing as saying the mystery of God should be finished. You see it? Boy, the Bible is a wonderful book, isn't it? The book of Revelation will be finished. We, we don't understand some things about Revelation. When we get into chapter 11, I'm going to have to do a whole lot of comparing and just leave things up to your opinion because it's too much for me. I've only been studying it straight out. I mean, I've read it over a hundred times, I know. But I've been hard studying the book of Revelation for over five, no, seven years now. And I still don't think I have a complete grasp on chapter 11. But I know one thing. Whenever Jesus comes back at that last trumpet, I'm going to fully understand Revelation chapter 11. Amen? And so will you. Because knowledge shall be increased. Amen? How about the, the mystery? How about this mystery? Uh, keep your hand here and go over to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. This is a mystery. Now, we as a church should understand this already, this mystery. But the world doesn't understand it. Amen? They will when Jesus comes back. But I want you to notice, uh, beginning in verse 15, what it says. He says, "...having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in Himself of twain one new man, so making peace." Who's the twain one new man? The Jews and the Gentiles coming to God the same way through Christ. Amen. What a mystery. Because the Jews thought they had the corner on salvation. Amen. What a mystery. Verse 16, And that He might reconcile both unto God into one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached pre peace to you which were afar off, that's us, and to them that were nigh, them that were Jews. For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, and whom all the building fitly framed together groweth in unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. My friends, right now in the world, especially the dispensational world, boy, that's a big chunk. That's a big chunk. Anybody that has any type of Christianity, the overwhelming majority believe in a pre-trib rapture. That's why it made so big at the movies. That's why it's so popular. That's why evangelists that travel around, you know, and they have their five sermons on prophecy, and they get to go around in churches like dummies, just keep paying them to talk about prophecy, and we go, ooh and ah. His ministry is not scriptural, and neither is what he's teaching scriptural. But the overall majority of people that call themselves Christians are dispensationalists. Okay, uh, <laughs> let me get my thought together because I had something on my mind and I, I don't want to blow it here. Oh, so they look at it like, well, I'm a Christian, but God's chosen people are the Jews. I got bad news for you. Did you just read what I read? Were you with me when I read that? Amen. We are 
the same through being born again and being baptized in the body of Christ. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Greek, a Roman. It doesn't matter. Even a Tennessean, even an Oki can get saved and baptized in the body and has equal standing with Moses, Abraham, amen, the apostles. That's a mystery to the world. They don't see it that way. They see all this big fight over Palestine and all that. You know how much wars and money is invested over that? Anyway, I'm going to tell you, the new, I believe with all my heart, and we'll see this later, that the New Jerusalem actually sits down there. Um, you say, well, why do you believe that, Brother Sam? Well, look at their territory that God promised them. Just look at it. And, um, boy, it goes all the way over there to, uh, well, I'm backwards, so it goes from Palestine, where the Mediterranean Sea is, down to the top of Egypt, up in past Syria, over uh, past Baghdad and all that. That's a huge area. And if you measured it out, it's probably about 1,500 miles that way and about 1,500 miles that way. Well, what else do we know of that's 1,500 miles each way? The New Jerusalem. That's, the Bible says that Abraham sought for a city, but he never found it. He sought for the city whose builder and maker was God. Amen. Have y'all seen a city whose maker is God other than typified in the church? No, we've not seen that building. But we're going to see that city 1,500 miles that way, 1,500 miles that way, and 1,500 miles that way. Amen. Uh, I don't know how I got off on that, but it's a beautiful thing. Amen. But the Jews and the Gentiles are the same kingdom. We're also going to learn what Revelation 17.5 tells us. And I'm going to pick up the pace now, so I'm not going to have you turning a lot. But Revelation 17 and verse 5 says, Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. Now, if, if you're in the church of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God has given unction and gifts in the body, you can understand that that's the same thing as the spirit of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. Amen. You can understand that it started with the apostasy of Baptists turning us into Catholics, which turned into Protestants, which turned into other cults. And all of that in a, not in a singular way, but in a general way is called the kingdom of Christ. They're all naming Christ. And it's mostly full of apostates. That's why the Bible says that when Christ returns in his kingdom, he will pluck out all things that offend. Boy, that's going to be a bunch. Amen, it's going to be a bunch. False doctrine, heresies, and so on. But we're going to, the world is going to see every bit of this. See, all these mysteries, that, that's why I believe he's saying here the mystery of God is not just one mystery and we debate about that mystery. I believe when you look at the Word and you study it and, and you just kind of look at the mysteriousness or the fact that God Himself is a mystery. Amen, but it's going to be made plain that day, isn't it? Amen. All right, let me give you the third one. So, in verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. All right? And then he says, As he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Now, I believe prophets here are, are, are a couple things. One, Old Testament prophets. Okay? Number two, um, I'm not so sure that he's talking about one of the 70 here. You remember he had 12 apostles and 70 prophets. I'm not so sure he's talking about them. Of course, I'm not sure he's not because the Scripture writers were called prophets just because they wrote Scripture. So let's say you're... Uh, Mark, John Mark, he may have been one of the 70, I don't know. But by the fact that he became a scripture writer, he's a prophet. Does it make sense? So what he's doing is he's telling us as the Bible has said all along. That, that's all he's telling us here. Amen. And let me give you some prophets that have talked about this. All right. First of all, in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 3, it says, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Well, there's that mystery about the Gentiles, isn't it? Matter of fact, in Luke 2, 32, it was quoted and said that Jesus would be a light to the Gentiles. 
As a matter of fact, where he roamed up in Galilee, that was an area of strong Gentile persuasion. Amen. And didn't he go through Samaria and save that woman? Amen. But this mystery will all come to light, as Isaiah said it would. Amen. Then we go on to Daniel in chapter 2 and verse 44. It says, The God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces uh, and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, I can't really dig into this, but that kingdom was established when Jesus set up His church. People don't understand that. John the Baptist said, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, there it was. Jesus was setting it up. He's king himself. He set it up. He's king over the church. We obey his ordinances because he's the king. He runs this ship. Amen. We do what he says, right? Um, however, that, that prophecy goes from that point all the way through. The kingdom of God shall always stand. And the church of Jesus Christ, according to Matthew 16 and 18, shall never have the gates of hell prevail against it. Amen. It's going to be marching. And I'm not talking about a post-millennial sense where the, where the church overcomes the world. That's garbage. The scriptures teach us that the church will be the small minimum in the world. Amen. But it, we're learning here that this mystery will be solved. That Daniel, this prophet, spoke and said not only would Christ start his kingdom, but his kingdom would rule on earth. That'll be opened up. Amen? All the things we've talked about, the prophets have spoken about. I think about Daniel 7 and verse 25. He says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. You know what he's talking about there? The beast. The mystery of iniquity. The uh, mystery Babylon. That's what he's talking about there. Amen. In Zechariah 14, 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and His name one. There's the millennial reign for you. That's what the seventh trumpet starts. Amen. And then we got the good old Apostle Paul in Romans eleven twenty five, 25. It deals with the mystery of the Jews. He says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In other words, at some point, and I believe the Valley of Dry Bones and Roman, Romans chapters 9-11 through 11 tell us, and I don't understand all of it, but the Jewish people will repent in great numbers like Gentiles do. I don't understand all that, but I will at the last trump. And it was spoken by the prophets, wasn't it? Have we adequately examined this verse? Amen. So let me close by saying the last trump will begin to separate Christendom. It will take out of Christendom and put it where it actually belongs. And that's with the rest of the Antichrist world. Amen. It's a time of the righteous resurrection and the calling away of the saints. And there will be no mysteries concerning the Word of God, concerning the dealings of God, especially when it comes to the world. They're going to understand everything that's been said. Amen? So I hope we've adequately uh, performed um, exegesis on that verse. All right, let's pray and we'll be dismissed.